This is going to be an overview for the book of Colossians. Now, the author is the Apostle Paul. The time period is 62 to 64 AD. You got four chapters, 95 verses, and 1,979 words. The theme is Jesus is our all in all. And the word all appears 28 times. Now, our three applications. Historically, Paul writes to the believers at Colossae to encourage them about their completeness in the Lord Jesus. Doctrinally, Paul mentions Laodicea five times and commands that the epistle be, be read to the church in Laodicea. So doctrinally, this letter can silence the false doctrine of the last days because the Laodicea is the last day, the church period of the last days, the church of Laodicea, as you see in the book of Revelation. Now, devotionally, we are complete in Christ, and God can make us a Philadelphian Christian who's not taken over by the Laodicean philosophy. Even though you're in the Laodicean church time period, you can be a Philadelphian Christian who's not taken over by the last day's philosophy. Now, let's look at each chapter. Chapter 1, Paul defines who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And he says in verse 10, that you might walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's what we're doing right now. We're increasing in the knowledge of God. Every day you want to wake up and increase in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though we are saved by grace through faith without works, we still need to walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing. As it said, we don't get saved by good fruits. We aren't kept saved by good fruits. Uh, you can't even prove yourself saved by your fruits. But you should have good fruits anyway. Matthew seven sixteen talks about knowing men by their fruits, but the context is knowing a false prophet by his fruits. And it's before Jesus Christ even died on the cross, was buried and resurrected. You know, we're not proving, we're not doing our good works to prove our salvation. We're, we're doing good works. We need to be doing them that we can walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. That's why we need to be doing them. Colossians 1.12 also said that we need to be increasing in the knowledge of God. And if you aren't consistently learning something, then you're consistently getting dumber. You can't remember everything you've learned, so you're constantly forgetting things that you've learned. And if you don't learn something new every day to replace what you're forgetting, then you're doing nothing but getting dumber. Colossians 1.13 says, Who hath delivered us? from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I've been delivered. I've had the same thing happen to me that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah had. They got delivered from the fiery furnace. I got delivered from a future hell. I've been translated into another kingdom, the kingdom of God specifically. The kingdom of heaven is a physical kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. And the moment I believe the gospel, God put me into the kingdom of God. It's a spiritual kingdom. Luke 17, 21 says, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Romans 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It's, it's within you. It's a spiritual thing. Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus Christ, I have redemption. He bought me. He purchased me with his own blood. Acts 20.28, 20, I'm bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6.20, this isn't just regular blood. This is God's blood. And Hebrews 9.22 says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews 9.12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. 
Now in Colossians chapter 1, you're going to find out who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Like I said, Paul defines who the Lord is. Colossians 1.15, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? If you've seen Jesus Christ, then you've seen the Father. In John 14, 9, it says, Jesus saith unto him, have I, been, have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Jesus is the invisible God. If Jesus wasn't God himself, then we would, we would be sinning and worshiping an image. But Jesus Christ is God. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn of every creature. This doesn't mean that he didn't always exist and was just born one day out of nowhere. He's always existed. But he left the third heaven where he was rich and for your sakes became poor. And he came down and was born of a woman so that he could take on the likeness of sinful flesh and live a sinless life in the flesh. And Mary was with child of the Holy Ghost so in the sense of Jesus Christ coming down in the flesh, he was the first person born of God. You see how the next verse prove he has, it proves he's always been here. Because it says in Colossians 1.16, Paul defines for us, lays it out clearly who he believes the Lord Jesus Christ is. He says, for by him were all things created. Paul believes Jesus is the creator. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. By him, Jesus, were all things created, the things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. The devil himself was created by him. Job twenty six thirteen said, His hand form, hath formed the crooked serpent. Ezekiel 28, 15 shows us there was a day when Lucifer was created. So Jesus is the creator. Colossians 1, 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. In case you need more evidence, it says he is before all things. This means he is God. Everything consists because of him. If it wasn't for him, do you think this world would just keep going and going? He's holding it all together. And it says in verse 18, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Jesus Christ is the head of the body of Christ, which is the church. The church is his body, and it's made up of every born-again believer. And we need to believe and act like he is the head and reverence him, just like a good woman does with her husband. We need to make sure that in all things, he might have the preeminence. There are certain diatrophies out there who love to have the preeminence. And it's funny how they preach Jesus Christ, but yet they still want the preeminent place over Jesus himself. If they were alive when Jesus Christ was walking on earth in the flesh, they would probably have a sermon series preaching against what they believed his false doctrine is. They would want the preeminent place over the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In Colossians 1.19, it says, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And Colossians 2.9 says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But Colossians 1.20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. There's the blood showing up again. That is a foundation of our faith. You better believe it is by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that you're saved and not just his death. The blood is what reconciled you to God. You are enemies. But now are you made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it says in verse 21, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. You see, in my sight, my standing is as holy and 
unblameable as the Lord Jesus Christ himself because I have Jesus Christ's righteousness imputed to me. I got that imputed to me when I believed on him. And God doesn't see the sin on my record when it comes to my standing, and he doesn't impute iniquity to me when it comes to my standing. I'm as perfect as the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, my, my state, my day-to-day -day walk, I still struggle with the flesh. I still struggle with sin. But none of that sin gets applied to my soul like it did before I was saved. And that's why God will continue to see me as holy. And if you're saved, God continues, continues to see you as holy. Even though you may struggle with sin in your day-to-day -day walk, if you're saved, God sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ on your record because of the blood. It says in Colossians 1.24, Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Once again, the church is defined. It's the Lord's body. Colossians 1.25, Whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. So the dispensation of God, this means God dispensed some things to Paul, and then Paul is giving it to us. God dispensed some mysteries to Paul that in other ages weren't made known yet. He says in verse 26, Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the, what is the riches of the glory of the, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this mystery that's been hid, the mystery is about Jesus Christ himself dwelling in the believer. It is a mystery how and why Jesus Christ would dwell in such a wicked vessel as us. Why would he dwell in what Paul calls a wretched man and a body of death? In the layout of C and age, you better have these doctrines nailed down in your mind. That way you're not going to be somebody that's just overcome with the layout of C and philosophy. Remember the blood of Jesus Christ. Remember that he is God manifested in the flesh and that he's the creator of all things. Remember that he needs the preeminent place. Remember that the church is his body and that he dwells in every born-again believer. That's so many things that Paul went over just in the first chapter. This is a great book for the last days because it's just going over all these doctrines that we need to know as believers. Now, chapter 2, you, get, you see the problem with the Laodicean church, philosophy, vain deceit, rudiments of the world. Colossians 2.8, it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. He's, he doesn't want them to be like Laodicea. During these days, we, we are seeing men who are spoiled through philosophy. They don't believe the scriptures. They allegorize everything. Their own intellect is their God. They think they are so smart, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They care more about the tradition of men. They say they believe the Bible, but once the Bible crosses their denomination, they take the denomination Every time. It says in Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him. Which is the head of all principality and power. In Jesus Christ I'm complete. And every principality and power that I face is under his feet. They can't take away my salvation. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. And here is one of my favorite doctrines in the Bible. You hear me talk about it a lot. It's the spiritual circumcision. Is It's important. You get this doctrine down in your mind. This is the circumcision made without hands. And this means it's a spiritual circumcision, you see, because it's made without hands. 
This means it's a spiritual circumcision. It took place the moment that you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't confuse it with the circumcision of the heart that you find in verses like Deuteronomy 10, 16, where it says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Because you see, that circumcision there is something they had a part in. Because he's telling them to circumcise the foreskin of their heart. When they would start following the Lord and be no more... <coughs> Excuse me, and be no more stiff necked. This spiritual circumcision in Colossians 2 is an operation the Lord Himself did, and you didn't even know that it took place. He cut your soul loose from your flesh the moment you got saved. And like I said, your soul's cut loose from your body. And now, since you've got the spiritual circumcision, when you sin, it's no longer applied to your soul. You see, before you were saved, your soul was stuck to your flesh. Therefore, any time you sinned, the sin didn't just affect your flesh. It also went to your soul. But when you got saved, God washed your soul in the blood of Jesus and cut your soul loose from the flesh with a spiritual circumcision, the circumcision made without hands, so that when you did sin, the sin couldn't, recontaminate your soul anymore and now when god sees your soul he sees it as holy and unblameable and unreprovable and it and it has the righteousness of jesus christ on it so colossians 2 11 and 12 in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of christ Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. The buried with him in baptism is not water. And remember that we are talking about spiritual things, the context. Notice, spiritual circumcision, the circumcision made without hands. Buried with him in baptism, spiritual baptism has nothing to do with water. This is the spirit baptism. It also took place when you got saved, and you didn't even know it until you read about it. it had nothing to do with water. This is the spirit baptism, 1 Corinthians twelve thirteen. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Not by one man are we water baptized into one body. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit placed you into the body of Christ. I'm baptized into the body of Christ. I'm raised up with the Lord made alive. He quickened me. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. You see, everything that could keep me out of heaven was nailed to the old rugged cross. In 1 Peter 2.24, it says, Who his own self bare our sins and his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The Lord took the cup of God's wrath on sin and still made a mockery of the devil and unclean spirits. He made a show of them openly. Colossians 2.15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. He made a fool of them fool out of him when he was on the cross i don't have to keep the law to be saved i don't have to keep the law to stay saved i don't have to keep the law to prove i'm saved i'm saved because i have the testimony of jesus christ and when the devil says you're not really saved you're going to hell i just give him my testimony i don't say well look what good works i've done i quit cussing i quit living like you no i don't say that if i say that then I make it about me, but it's about the Lord Jesus Christ. He died on the tree for me. So when the devil says I'm not saved, I don't remind him about the good things that I'm doing or the good things that I've done. I give him my testimony that the Lord Jesus Christ died for me. He paid for my sins. 
He shed his blood, and I, my faith is in that. That's, my faith is was in that to save me, and my faith is in that is in that, and that's what that's who keeps me saved is the Lord Jesus. I overcome the devil by the word of my testimony, just like Revelation twelve eleven, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. My testimony is sure. For me, I know there was a day when I believed on Jesus Christ and I've been saved ever since. And if I'm looking at my progress and growth in living for the Lord after I'm saved to prove that I'm saved, that's not a sure thing. I could mess up tomorrow and be back in a horrible backslid condition. Anybody, but anybody, that can happen to anybody. I don't care who you are. And at the same time, anybody can turn over a new leaf and do better. Anybody can start trying to do better and not necessarily be saved. So if you're looking at a life of good morals and putting down the flesh, that doesn't necessarily prove anything. The way you overcome the devil when he's coming at you saying you're not really saved is by the word of your testimony. Was there a day when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? When he approaches you like this, don't say, well, I quit cussing, I quit drinking, I quit watching that stuff, or whatever you were doing before you were saved. That's not how you do it. You say, I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and by the blood of the Lord Jesus, I'm saved, and you can't have my soul. Colossians two sixteen and 17, let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Great verses here. When the Seventh-day Adventist jumps you and says you're not honoring the Sabbath, Sabbath day, just show him these verses and read my lips. Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. That's what you can say. So if you if they can't judge you in respect of an holy day or of the Sabbath days, what are they even talking about? What are they even going on about? I don't have to keep the Sabbath. Jesus Christ is my rest. I'm in him because I'm in the body. I don't have to acknowledge an holy day. Uh, the Bible's, uh, Paul says in Romans, One man esteemeth one day above another, another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. There's not a certain day that's more holy than another day. The Sabbath days are a shadow of things to come because they come back in, into action in the tribulation after the body of Christ leaves. And that's why in Matthew 24, 20, Jesus is talking about the end times. And he says, pray that your flock be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. You see, the Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel, not between God and the body of Christ. But in the tribulation, it goes back to God dealing with Israel, dealing, using signs and things like that. The Sabbath is a sign. It comes back into action in the tribulation. It's a shadow of, it's just a shadow of something that's coming. Now, chapter 3 through 4 will show you how to overcome Laodicean philosophy, the last day's philosophy. In chapter 3, Paul talks about seek things which are above, mortify your members, put on the new man, let the word of Christ dwell in you, worship with the right music, know your role in the home. All these things that's great advice in colossians 3 1 and 2 it says if you then be risen with christ seek those things which are above where christ sitteth on the right hand of god set your affection on things above not on things on the earth great verses to go along with this matthew six nineteen through 21 lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither, neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You see, if your treasure is down here, then your heart won't be up there. Colossians 3.3 3, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. 
Your flesh is doctrinally dead and you're alive in Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then she shall ye also appear with him in glory. If you make Jesus Christ your life, notice it says, When Christ, who is our life, when Jesus Christ is your life, you won't have any problem setting your affection on things above. It says in verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You see, your flesh is dead, and if you serve the flesh, then you're serving a dead corpse. So you need to mortify your members. That means you need to bring them into subjection. 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul says, But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. You don't have to let the flesh control you. You control the flesh. Your flesh is dead. Surely you can control, take some control of the flesh. I don't believe you're going to win every battle. But you can clamp down on the flesh. Colossians 3.24 Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For ye serve the Lord Christ. You see, living wicked won't make you lose salvation, but it will cause you to lose the reward of the inheritance. So serve the Lord Christ and not the flesh. Colossians 3.25 But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. There is no respect of persons. That means it doesn't matter who does wrong and who does right. They will reap what they sow. Now, chapter 4. This is... I'm just going to go ahead and close it up real quick with this one. In chapter 4, it talks about remember your master in heaven. Pray for a door to preach him and redeem the time. In Colossians 4, 5, it says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. That's a great verse. You see, you need to redeem the time. God has the hourglass. He knows how much time is left. He's the one who, who turned it upside down. He's the one that started it all. He gave you a gift, and that is the gift of time. So you need to redeem it. He had a certain amount of time that he wanted to pass, that he wanted man to live in, and he gave you a chunk of that time. Some people, he gave more time. Like Methuselah, he gave him a lot more time than he gave you for whatever reason. But still, he gave you a gift, a gift of time. And every second that goes by is a second that you can't get back. So don't lay around all the day idle. Get busy and do something that's going to affect eternity. I mean, the new year's about to start. Get back into your Bible reading. Think about it like this. If you read five chapters in the Old Testament a day, five chapters in the New Testament a day, you can read the Old Testament twice in a year, the New Testament seven times a year. If you did an overview of each book of the Bible, just like what I did here, if you did one, did this for one book a week, you would have most of the New Testament done in a year just by doing one of these a week. If you do a verse-by-verse verse on a chapter of, uh, of a book of the Bible a week, like starting Revelation 1, do Revelation 1 this week, you'll be done with the book of Revelation before the middle of the year. You'll do like 52 chapters. That's 52 chapters that you didn't know anything about that you'll know by the end of the year. Uh, if you do a t one topic a week, do a topic a week, that's 52 topics you're going to know by the end of the year that you did not know at the beginning of the year. And if you do all three of those, do a book of the Bible, do a verse by verse of a chapter, one a week, do one topic a week, 
Imagine how much more you're going to know about the Lord and, and you're going to increase in the knowledge of God, redeeming the time, doing those things, and then reading your chapters daily. You, you can read more this year than you've read your entire life put together if you really put your mind to it. Trade in your hobbies for the book. Ditch the video games. Get the book out. You spend so much time. There are people that spend like in a, probably like a, a week's time. If their time on the video game was calculated, it's going to amount to like three whole days that they're spending out of seven days on the video game. Imagine if that was all in the book. You could be a Bible genius. You could be increasing in the knowledge of God. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. God gave you a gift of time, and you need to use it wisely.